So hello and welcome to our to Cambridge Art Association's March 25th, 2021 virtual studio visit with Cindy Liu. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone to remain muted during the speaker portions of this event. We do ask that you use the chat, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, to let us know where you're joining from. Uh, I'm joined today by CAA's program coordinator, Candace Bankeri. Candace will monitor the chat and moderate the Q&A today. If you have any questions for Cindy at any point, please type them into the chat. And at the end of our visit, we'll have time for a live Q&A where we will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. As we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are gathered on both literally and virtually. Today, I join you from Cambridge, Massachusetts on the traditional lands of the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag. As an organization, the CAA acknowledges the painful history of this territory and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land on which we gather. And now I'd like to introduce you to Cindy Liu. Cindy is a former scientist who has been making art full-time since 2017. After studying molecular and cell biology and French at UC Berkeley, Lou completed doctoral studies at Harvard University and postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School. Lou then worked as a scientific editor at the journal Cell before shifting gears into art. Lou's interest in transforming three-dimensional forms as well as sensory perception and integration echo the subjects of her scientific research, which included tissue, morphogenesis, and neuroscience. Lou lives and works in Boston, and I'm pleased to welcome Cindy Lou. Awesome, thank you so much, Erin. And thank you everyone who showed up. Um, I am just so happy to be able to talk with you guys today about my work. I'm sitting here in my studio space in Hyde Park, which I just moved into this past summer. Um, and so I'm just gonna first walk around a little bit and give you a little tour. Maybe change the orientation. Okay, so um, I moved into this space in the summer and I'm just gonna show you because I'm very proud that I actually built a wall. <laughs> so um, this wall here didn't exist before. Um, and so I installed this door. You can see the common space here. Um, oh, there's my friend, Joanna. I don't know if you can see her. Um, so this, um, this is an old, um, industrial building in um, Hyde Park. And there are a bunch of different artists in this space with their own studios. And so, um, you know, again, I only just moved in in the summer. And so um, I'm really looking forward to the time when we'll be able to all gather together um, amongst all the artists. I also built this storage structure, which I was very excited about. Um, so I can hide away all my stuff. So, um, maybe I'll just start on my wall here. I have a little bit of my work up here. Um, maybe I'll start with this here. So, um, get back up a little bit. So this, these two pieces here with the um, gold and also silver down here, um, this is from a series of work that I did dealing with um, immigration and migration. And so, I began this work um, after seeing some footage, um, I think this was back in 2018, um, seeing some footage of refugees um, disembarking from boats and landing on the shores um, in Greece. And there were aid workers there and um, there was footage of one aid worker taking one of these emergency blankets and then wrapping it very gently around someone's shoulders. So these are very lightweight mylar blankets that maybe you've seen at the end of the Boston Marathon. Those are usually the, silver, the cheaper silver ones. But um, yeah, so this image of someone just so tenderly wrapping this blanket around someone's shoulders um, for me was really beautiful. And I, um, so the series of work is sort of like imagining a um, prolonging that moment or extending that moment or, ex or maybe suspending that moment in time, if you will. And so, um, and so if I go a little closer, this one, um, this is a qu quilt-like object that I made um, out of emergency blankets. And then I 
um, you can see here. Then I embroidered um, individual French knots um, to back up here to form um, the continents. And this particular projection is one that more accurately represents the ratios of the land masses, um, unlike the Mercator projection, which is, is often used. Um, and it's also from um, what I was considering to be a celestial perspective. So kind of uh, from the North Pole, um, instead of um, you know, prioritizing a particular country or region. Um, and the areas with more green are showing kind of hard to see. The areas with more green are um, places that people are migrating to at the moment. And so all of this was like very, <laughs> it was a very long process of making these individual hand-tied French knots. Um, and then another piece that I did in this series um, is here. So I then took these emergency blankets and then worked them um, in different ways. So here you can see um, soccer ball. And then I um, cut the um, emergency blankets into strips and then crocheted them um, to make this uh, stuffed toy, the bunny, and then also um, twisting it into rope for a jump rope. And so especially the twisting process for me um, was meaningful because um, this sense of taking this really old technique of taking something that's very fragile. So these blankets, even though when they're in one piece, they seem like fairly strong, but as soon as you puncture or cut into them, they, it's, they just kind of melt like butter. They just completely come apart. And so there's a fragility um, that's in tension here with um, this strength. And so when you make, you know, I think most people know, like when you take something really fragile, you can even take grass, or other fibers and then twist them into a rope, um, it becomes very, very strong. And so, um, yeah, so all of this, these two pieces were in conjunction with another piece, which I don't have up because it's a 15 foot diameter parachute. <laughs> and so um, I don't have that up in this space, but um, this was a series I did on immigration. And um, let's see, maybe I'll go to this one. This is a piece I did I believe in 2019, maybe it was 2018. Um, this is dealing with issues of race and skin color. So um, a couple of years ago, um, there's something called the um, international standard or international prototype of the kilogram. And so this is the, um, the standard that was used to determine what is a kilogram. So it's this little um, cylinder of metal that was housed in three, three um, nested bell jars that would keep it under vacuum and protect it from degradation or from um, any kind of loss or gain of mass. And so this is used as a standard to say um, how heavy a kilogram is or what the mass of a kilogram is. Um, and so it actually got decommissioned a couple years ago and um, there's something really striking about the appearance of it. And um, I was thinking about um, this sort of concept of having to have a standard um, because something, um, because a measure is um, really kind of arbitrary <laughs> and the, the ways in which you have to protect that standard in order to prevent um, anything from changing. And uh, for me, that really um, was making me think of um, these questions of what is whiteness. And so instead of a metal cylinder, what I have inside here is actually um, sort of lighter shades of face powder that I've compressed down into a cylinder. And then um, this is not really under vacuum, <laughs> but I have these bell jars um, and a sort of faux setup for a vacuum. Um, and then Here's the plaque. Um, so instead of an, the international prototype for the kilogram, it's for whiteness. Um, this, this institute and bureau, neither of them actually exist <laughs> in reality, but um, for me, there's just a sense of the way in which 
um, this particular standard, um, it, it almost feels like there has been some official um, institute or bureau that has made these decisions um, that are really quite arbitrary. So, and this notion of um, white fragility, like this need, need to protect um, whiteness, this is what this piece deals with there. So here, it's a bunch of stuff in progress. It's very messy. Oh, there's my dog. Say hi, Ella. She's like, whatever. <laughs> um, so actually, um, part of, this is the piece here. So this is a piece that was in a recent CAA show. Um, this, um, these are units that I made that were molded. They're, it's made of silicone and they're molded um, out of infant pacifiers. And it has to do with questions of the body. Also, um, it's part of a larger body of work that I'm, that's sort of still in progress. It's, it's somewhat related to this actually. Um, this was a, some previous work that I did. There are other pieces as well. Um, and also there was an eight by foot black box that you could walk into that had sort of smaller versions of this encrusting um, the ceilings and walls, the ceiling and walls, and it had like sort of pulsating light at the tips. But um, this is a, this is work that I did um, kind of reacting or responding to um, issues of data collection. So these are, um, these are pipettes that you would use in a lab. So you would like squeeze this and then suck up material. And so I made these, I sort of aggregated, like, I don't even know how many thousands of pipettes for all these um, into these sculptures that are, um, this is actually kind of akin to a developmental series um, with like this maybe being, you know, very young. <laughs> and then this one, um, there's this process called invagination where, um, where you get like um, a cavity that's formed. And then here you can actually see um, it goes all the way through to the other side. So this actually reflects um, <laughs> maybe slightly nerdy thing to be talking about, but the basic animal body plan. So the idea is that um, there are these um, entities um, that are really trying to suck up our data, suck up um, our, it's sort of like a digital biopsy, if you will. And so um, imagining that um, these creatures, um, this sort of new quasi life form um, is developing and growing and evolving um, in order to um, collect our data. And so, Together with that, there are these issues of surveillance and the body, the body as a locus, both of surveillance and of resistance. And so um, here's another piece. Um, here's another one that's in progress. Um, I've kind of like paused this particular project um, for now um, and sort of got distracted and working on something else. This is actually um, something that I've been working on Get, you get a sneak preview. Um, so these are, they're supposed to be like quail and they're made out of roasted watermelon seeds. Um, so these are, um, this is something that is a very like common snack for Chinese people. And so for me um, growing up, often we would just sit around the table, just my family, or maybe if guests came over, we would sit around the table eating um, roasted watermelon seeds. And it's a very kind of slow leisurely thing because you have to, they're quite hard. And so you have to like crack them in your teeth and you get this one little tiny seed. Um, I mean, similar to uh, say sunflower seeds or something. And so it's this very, for me, um, this material is very much about like a communal interaction and just a time of, of um, being together. And so maybe you've noticed like um, one of the big things for me um, in my art practice is um, materiality. So often I will start out with a material that means something to me and an idea. And so um, those things will kind of 
somehow come together in my mind and then uh, form form something. And so this um, these are actually going to be um, together with, um, I think, an embroidered piece that um, I don't have here with me. Um, it's at home right now still, but um, kind of meant to echo um, sort of traditional Chinese paintings and dealing with um, wordplay as well, because um, quail um, in Chinese sounds like um, the word peace. But at the same time, quail were also symbolizing courage and kind of like fighting. And so, um, and there also are, um, there's symbolism with, with numbers as well in terms of um, how they sound, the other words that they sound like. And so um, I won't talk too much about this, but this is sort of something in progress, kind of um, thinking about what it means for us to live together as people. And there's, um, you know, there's quite a bit of tension in um, this. In general, I would say a lot of my work um, sort of resides in some kind of intermediate space or an in-between space. And so um, there being tension between um, opposing forces or ideas um, and, and kind of sitting in that space because um, for me, the, an, intermediate, um, an intermediate stage or space or um, state is a place of a lot of possibility. It's a, it's a place of a lot of tension. <laughs> There's a possibility of things going very badly, but also the possibility of things um, really transforming into, um, into something maybe that I would desire, maybe you would desire. Um, of, um, of really our society uh, becoming a place where we really actually care for one another and, um, and really end all the inequities and problems. Right, Ella? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what time is it now? Cindy, I'm gonna interject uh, quickly. Uh, I didn't wanna uh, interrupt your thought process there, but... Um, I did want to open it up to questions. If people have some, I will start off with one question for myself since we haven't um, gotten any just yet. Um, I'm really interested, Cindy, in your this kind of like repetition of form that seems yes. to uh, occur in your work. Um, mm -hmm. and I know that you've talked a little bit about materiality, but can you talk about that? And and is there like a a tension or a tension that kind of evolves from this repetition of form where it's just so like beautifully executed. Um, but it, uh, I don't know, it, it also has this like tactileness to it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, in part this sort of repetition um, is related to my background as a researcher in biology because. Um, there's a lot that you do that's really repetitive, um, but there is a, um, you have to still pay a lot of attention. <laughs> like, so there's this like, this like kind of tension between something that feels repetitive, maybe rote, but then you still have to really focus, otherwise something will mess up. And so a lot of my work actually does feature that. Um, it also, I think for me, it's about like iteration, iteration leading to something like, um, something better in a sense or something that like often your experiments would um, only quote unquote succeed if you did them multiple times actually. And so um, because maybe you messed up one little part, um, something else kind of went awry. Um, there's also this concept of iteration in order to um, have a statistically significant result. And so there's this idea of uh, repeating, iterating, not only for transformation, but also for kind of like a fuller picture of what's happening. So I think, um, I actually never really um, have talked about that before, but I think a lot of that comes from my science background and the processes of um, both science and art for me um, are very linked. Yeah, I could see that. Um, and actually I wanna segue to a question, a question from Irene. Um, which is what prompted you to switch careers? Um. Oh, yeah, you know, um, 
it's kind of hard to explain. I was, you know, in my job and I was actually lined, I lined up another job for myself and was actually about to take it. But then I just felt like I couldn't take, I couldn't send the email, the thank you email after the second interview. And really, I think there was just something in me that was like stirring that I really wanted to be able to learn how to sort of apprehend the world in a different way. You know, I had used this scientific lens for so long. And, um, and at the time I didn't really know that I wanted to do art. Like I just knew it was sort of something in that direction. <laughs> and so, you know, being a somewhat practical person, I wouldn't have like quit my job to say, I'm gonna be an artist. But over time, as I kind of explored, I realized, oh, this is actually what it is. And actually I quit about three weeks before um, the 2016 general election. And so there was something I think stirring in me about um, what's happening in our society, in our world, um, that I felt like um, couldn't really be addressed in the, in the things that I was doing. And so I, I think it was something, just feeling something in the air and really feeling a need to respond to it. Um, I think that's sort of, the best explanation I can give. <laughs> yeah, um, and I do want to remind you just to talk a little bit about your group show at the oh yes of the arts, and then we mm -hmm. have we do have another question from Janet that I want to get to as well. Okay, so um, I'm, I have some work in a show coming up. It's an online exhibit for uh, people who received um, the Red Bull Arts Micro Grant in Boston. It's together with the Boston Center for the Arts, and so. Um, I use this material here again, it's about materials. This is um, called parafilm, I'll show you here. Um, this is a material that I would often use in lab. Um, I'd use it to wrap things like wrap tubes or plates of bacteria or something um, in order to sort of protect and preserve it. Um, you may have also seen it on the stems of uh, a bunch of bananas, I've seen that <laughs> used before as well. Um, but otherwise it's not something that you see very commonly. But there's something about this material that for some reason it just popped into my mind. And um, so this is sort of towards the beginning of the pandemic, this, I was thinking about this. And so, um, but it didn't feel like the right time. And um, so to, to actually do anything with it at, towards the beginning of the pandemic. But just um, a few weeks ago, I ended up um, doing this project, um, sorry, let me try and not be too shaky here, um, where I went to Franklin Park, um, which is in Jamaica Plain where I live. Um, so this is the park that I, you know, go to a lot and walk my dog there. Um, and, you know, going there more during the pandemic, but, um, there's this sense of, quietness there but also it's a space where a lot of people come together from different neighborhoods different backgrounds it's a it's such a beautiful space it's actually the largest open space in Boston a lot of people don't know about it um, but it's really gorgeous and so what I this bench here is like one of my favorite benches and you can see it's really beautiful and um, so what I ended up doing is wrapping this bench in parafilm so you can see the process Here it is, partly wrapped. And here's a photo of it fully wrapped. And for me, there was a sense, it's a sort of a combination of just in general, like general being like kind of at home and isolated um, in lockdown because of COVID, but also um, I didn't, haven't printed this photo, but part of it is that um, in the process of wrapping, um, it was a super cold day. And so I had to breathe on the parafilm in order to warm it up so I could stretch it. It's a very it's like a stretchy material. And so that's um, part of what helps you to seal. And so um, for me, there's this sense of breath being life, but also, um, you know, I'm Asian American and as you know, COVID hit really um, so many of us have experienced um, a lot of you know, racist comments and many um, sadly have been targets of violence, as you know, um, both with a lot of elderly people who have been 
um, assaulted physically and also with the shootings in Atlanta. And so, um, so I actually made this before the Atlanta shootings, but you know, there was this sort of like, you could feel this like pre-existing, like latent, but you know, hostility, but that kind of like rose to the surface or like was, you know, bursting into the air. And for me, um, this, this sort of idea of a possibility of transformation. So this is sort of like a cocoon-like form. Um, and then after a period of a quarantine, so like a 10 day quarantine, I unwrapped. And actually I hadn't noticed this before, but someone um, um, had spray painted very faint, but I kind of tweaked it a little bit in Photoshop so you could actually see it, um, graffiti that says sit. So it's like this kind of faint tentative invitation. Um, and then the parafilm is like this shroud-like form, which I then heated up and compressed into what looks kind of like a stone. And I placed it at the base of a nearby tree. So for me, there's it's this continuing idea of the possibility of transformation. You know, it looks like kind of almost natural. So it's like a sense of belonging. Um, but yeah, so for me, this piece, there's a lot of feeling of, it's like a tension, like a hope for the possibility of transformation, you know, like metamorphosis involves a lot of cell death, rewiring of neural circuits, not to get too nerdy, but <laughs> you know, it's, um, yeah, so that's the piece that's gonna be, so it's really kind of like a installation, performance, temporary art kind of, outdoor art kind of thing. Um, and the photos that I took are gonna be part of the show at the BCA. Great, thank you. Um, and I hope everyone saw, but I put a, um, a link to that in the chat um, and we encourage you guys to check it out. Um, Aaron, do we have one, uh, time for one more question? It looks like we have two more questions. I think as long as Cindy's okay, we, we have time for both of them. Right. Sure. sure, that's fine. Okay. All right, so this question is from Janet. Um, she says, I'm curious about the watermelon seeds, a mouth-based habit slash community activity and the slippage between sounds and language. I wonder if you could speak more to that sense-based tactility in your work. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, I think you've seen a, one of the through lines in my work. Um, for me, um, I've always been very interested in other senses other than vision. <laughs> and so um, there's something, I think we're very vision dominated um, as, a, as, as people, um, for those who do have, who are sighted. Um, and so there is um, a sense in which I think moving to other, um, other senses, um, for me opens up something different. Um, a sort of maybe for me a deeper knowledge and a more embodied knowledge. Um, so for me, even just like holding those little quail as I was making them, there's something about the feeling of them, touching them um, that um, for me is meaningful. And so the, even the uh, pacifiers, um, <laughs> you know, I did actually, maybe it sounds weird, but um, I did actually see what it would feel like to actually suck on one of them when these clusters, these clusters that look like kind of like an epithelium. And it's really, the, it was crazy because like, I mean, it's been a very long time <laughs> since I was like an infant that I've done that, but something just immediately like triggered. It felt like this distant memory, a distant knowledge that um, I had sort of forgotten about. And so I think there's something very powerful in in tactility and other senses as well, um, that kind of, that we've kind of distanced ourselves from in being so visually um, oriented. Hmm. Yeah, and I love as a scientist that you're even open to other forms of knowledge and, um, and, and investigating them actively. Um, so this question is, I guess this will be our last question um, from Gregory. Uh, said, Hi, Gregory. <laughs> do you find the repetition and iterations perhaps meditative and peaceful or more so an investigation into how deep your artistic patients can transform materials? Thanks, that's a great question. I would say both. There's something about, um, especially when I was doing the French knots, I mean, I was really like, it was a very meditative process and think actually kind of thinking about people who um, who are um, 
immigrating and who are um, who find themselves in like a refugee camp and the and it was a space of really um, being able to enter into like a, a presence like with um, amongst other people in a sense. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of that? <laughs> um. So whether you find that to be meditative or peaceful, which sounds like you do, um, or more so an investigation into how deep your artistic patients can transform materials. I'm willing to yes. bet it's a little bit of both, but. Yes, yes, the second one as well, because I think um, it's only, because so much of what I'm doing, um, it's only with a lot of iteration that you get the full form. And as I'm doing it, maybe less so with the map because I did have that kind of projected out, but with the um, pipette forms, like the, well, the ones that were like these um, um, beings for the um, data collection project, like that for me, I had to really respond to the materials. And so, um, and really seeing it take shape and what form it could make. Um, and so a lot of it really was determined by the, you know, parameters of the material itself. And then, um, and so what came out of it, I had something in mind, but, um, but it really was an exploration of the material as well and that what, what could come out of it. So, and that could only come out with this iterative process. That's great. Thank you so much, Cindy. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of talk about or, um, um, I don't think so. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming and asking such great questions. It's like a lot of it is making me think more too <laughs> about my own practice. So I really, I really appreciate all your questions. Thank you. Yeah. It was wonderful to see a little bit um, more of the space that you're working in and kind of how you're jumping from project to project or, um, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you for to everyone who joined us here today. Um, I appreciate Cindy, you're letting us into your practice and getting a sneak peek of some of your new work. Um, folks, if you're not following Cindy already, we did drop um, her Instagram and her website links into the chat, which we will save and share with you. Um, this whole thing was recorded. So if you came late or if you decide you wanna share it with someone else, um, it will be posting to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days and we'll share that link with everyone. Um, but thanks so much for joining us and thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much to you, Erin, and also Candice and the CAA for hosting this. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you.